A resuming debate, I please you the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's my privilege to rise to speak to Bill C-33, um, described as an act to establish a framework to enable First Nations control of elementary and secondary education and to provide for related funding and to make related amendments to the Indian Act and to consequential amendments to other acts. Mr. Speaker, in speaking to this bill, um, I think it's incumbent upon everyone in this place to remember Shannon's dream. I feel the emotion coming. I think anybody in this place that's had an opportunity to uh, meet with uh, the family of Shannon Kustashin from Attawapiskat and uh, the incredible energy and drive of the children from her community who have continued her campaign can help but feel a little uh, emotional in discussing this legislation. Um, those in the House are aware of Shannon's campaign. Shannon campaigned for every Aboriginal child to have equal access to quality education in this country. A pretty reasonable campaign. Sadly, Shannon was killed in an accident uh, driving from her community to high school because she could not receive quality education in her own community. Um, the quotes of Shannon in her campaign that have led school children across this country for years towards uh, provision of funding and guarantees and uh, ability of First Nations to deliver their own uh, programs include, in quotes, she campaigned to help end the underfunding of First Nations schools, end of quotes. In quotes, school should be a time for dreams. Every kid deserves this, end of quotes. And I have to share with you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, when I had the privilege of being the Aboriginal Affairs critic for uh, the uh, NDP party, I had the honour of receiving a cardboard-made schoolhouse made by um, elementary school children in uh, this province. It was filled with letters that they had written to the Prime Minister begging him to extend equal opportunity to quality education for Aboriginal children so they'd have the same privileges of all other children in Canada. And uh, we did actually manage to get approval and actually delivered that up to the Prime Minister's office. It was an incredible moment in time. And since then, I've had an opportunity with my colleagues to attend many of these occasions where the Canadian children have spoken out on behalf of extending equal rights to Aboriginal children. Um, we've also often heard the quote from the National Chief of the Assembly First Nations, a very sad commentary on the long-standing state of education for Aboriginal children, and that is that more Aboriginal children are incarcerated than graduate from high school. In speaking to Bill uh, C-33, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's important at the outset to set the stage for assessing this bill and whether it respects critical overriding rights and responsibilities. I will be concentrating my comments on Bill 30, C-33 to two factors. Thank you very much. The extent, firstly, the extent to which the government has met its legal and constitutional duties to consult, and secondly, comments that have been made to date by Alberta First Nations and shared with me and that they have requested that I share with this place. In respect for First Nations' overriding right to establish and deliver their own education programs within their cultural lang and language traditions for their children and their communities and to determine if those rights and opportunities have been accorded, um, I will be concentrating my comments on that. Um, I and my uh, colleagues in the official opposition hold firm with the position that we must uphold uh, constitu the Constitution and international uh, obligations and commitments and our own personal commitment to First Nations that we respect their right to assert uh, uh, self-government and to plan and deliver their own education program for their own families. It is our duty in this place, all of us who are duly elected, to ensure that Aboriginal peoples have access to education, to determine their own education systems and to practice their traditional and cultural beliefs. That those um, rights and our obligations are specified, as I mentioned, in a number of international conventions and, uh, and UN treaties. For example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child at Article 28, Mr. Speaker, states, 
that states parties recognize the right of the child to education and with a view to achieving this right progressively and on the basis of equal opportunity they shall in particular make primary education compulsory and available to all. Article 29 states that states parties agree that the education of the child shall be directed to including the development of respect for the child's parents, his or her own cultural identity, language and values for the national values of the country in which the child is living, the country from which he or she may originate and for civilizations different from his or her own. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, we on this side of the house were uh, delighted when the government finally came around and agreed to um, assent to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Well, in so doing, what has the government committed to undertake? Article 14 states, Indigenous peoples have the right to establish and control their education systems and institutions, providing education in their own languages, in a manner appropriate to their cultural methods of teaching and learning. Secondly, Indigenous individuals, particularly children, have the right to all levels and forms of education of the state without discrimination, and states shall, in conjunction with Indigenous peoples, take effective measures in order for Indigenous individuals, particularly children, including those living outside their communities, to have access when possible to an education in their own culture and provided in their own language. Article 15, Mr. Speaker, states, Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories, and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public information. And Article 18 and 19, Mr. Speaker, speak to uh, the duty of the government and the right of, of Aboriginal peoples to govern their own matters. Article 18 states, Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures. Article 19 states, states shall consult and cooperate in good faith in order to obtain their free, prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. So, Mr. Speaker, it's pretty clear um, what the obligations of this government are, the commitments that they've undertaken, and what the associated rights and opportunities are for First Nations. Included among those is the duty of the federal government to consult and accommodate uh, Aboriginal people's uh, views, perspectives, and interests. And in implementing um, in support of First Nation education, the federal government has an overriding duty for advanced consultation and accommodation of Aboriginal right and title. This is required under the Canadian Constitution and under provisions of the historic and modern treaties. That duty applies to any federal policy, law, or regulation making process that may potentially or directly impact the rights and title of First Nation peoples. The matter to consider is, do the substantive measures set forth in Bill C-33 actually deliver on the rights, principles, and duties ascribed to in the preamble of the Act? Well, Mr. Speaker, what does the preamble hold out? And I think it's very important for us to consider that, not just the substantive provisions, but a preamble sets forth uh, to those who are affected by the law exactly what they intend to do. It, it states the intent. Uh, and it is noteworthy that the government right at the outset uh, notes um, the failings um, in the establishment and running of the uh, residential schools and uh, the need to seek a partnership with First Nations in a spirit of reconciliation. I might share here, Mr. Speaker, I had the privilege several times of participating in the Truth and Reconciliation uh, proceedings and uh, at the conclusion, the National Conclusion Assembly in Edmonton a few months back, I was struck very personally by the fact that a residential school um, on the edge of my city, uh, children was from as far away as the Queen Charlotte Islands were transported by train and held in that school with no contact to their friend or families for up to a year and longer while I was attending elementary school at the same time. And to hear firsthand of the abuses that went on, it has made me all the more dedicated to make sure that their rights are respected. I will just mention, Mr. Speaker, 
some of the provisions of the preamble. Uh, in doing so, I highly recommend to all the members of this place, it is absolutely critical that they read carefully this preamble, because this is what the government is holding out that they are about to deliver on the behalf of the First Nation peoples of Canada. For example, whereas First Nations education system should be designed and implemented in accordance with the principle that First Nations have control of the children's education. Secondly, whereas First Nations must receive support that enables them to exercise their rights and fulfill the responsibilities relating to elementary and secondary education provided to their children. Thirdly, whereas First Nations children attending schools on reserves must have access to education that is founded on First Nations history, culture, and traditional values, and enable them to participate fully in the social, economic, political, and educational advancement of First Nations. And on it goes, making a variety of undertakings. An equally important one, Mr. Speaker, is, whereas First Nations education systems must receive adequate, stable, predictable, and sustainable funding that provides for the teaching of First Nation languages, culture, as well as for education support services. And finally, uh, whereas elementary and secondary education is an essential part of lifelong learning. And in continuing uh, my presentation, I will uh, reference to those specific undertakings by the government. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, I feel it incumbent in speaking to this bill that it not be my personal opinion that I um, am obligated to reach out to the First Nations to find out what are their views, both about the process of developing this bill and secondly, what actually is being delivered under this legislation. And I have continued to dialogue with the First Nations uh, in Alberta particularly, but as well across the country in uh, cooperation with my colleagues. I spoke only yesterday with Alberta Regional Chief Cameron Alexis and also with Chiefs from Treaty 8 and have reviewed materials that they have prepared, letters that they have submitted to the Government of Canada. So what has been their views expressed um, about the uh, respect for First Nation determination of the education systems, uh, whether or not adequate funding is provided, whether or not, in fact, we are finally enabling that their education system will also incorporate First Nation language, culture, and traditions. Well, um, I was advi advised by uh, the Regional Chief Alexis that uh, he was directly in the process of continuing to consult Treaty 6, 7, and 8 First Nations who are still going through the process of trying to understand and review this bill. Uh, for many of, uh, of the chiefs and isolated communities and their community members, it's an extremely complex process and they're struggling to comprehend what the implications are of the provisions, whether or not they're actually addressing what their priorities are. Well, what are the issues that they have, have raised? Top issue has been raised by uh, uh, my colleagues in the House the lack of adequate consultation in the very drafting of this bill. Though this is coming from the First Nations themselves. This is not a determination that I have made. Uh, Chief Alexis shared that there remains considerable contention over whether the government has fully addressed the long-standing issues of First Nations in access to quality education. First and foremost, he expressed strong concern that the First Nations themselves were not accorded adequate opportunity for consultation and necessary accommodation, as is the duty of the Crown. Chief Alexis stated the consultations were held only in major centres, and I heard this a year back when I met with uh, a number of the chiefs and councils. They're concerned that no consultations were held in any of the First Nation communities themselves with their memberships, and particularly in the isolated communities. Many First Nations are still struggling with comprehending the bill, in many cases, there's been a change in, in leadership and council, and they feel very responsible for ensuring that this legislation is actually representing the rights and title of their members. Regional Chief Alexis is requesting that Bill C-33 be tabled until after the summer break to provide a more reasonable time period for the individual First Nation leaders to consult their communities on the provisions of the bill. He has already requested that Parliament take the bill out to the communities for consultation. And I anticipate that uh, the Minister and the Government is going to be hearing this message from the individual Chiefs. Well, what have some of the individual Chiefs had to say about this bill? I'll just avoid, ignore whatever rude comment came across the floor. Um, from Treaty 8 First Nations, Mr. Speaker. Um, from 
Grand Chief Capo of Treaty 8. He has stated in his letter, um, we, in quotes, we are looking for something that is developed in the true spirit of cooperation and co-development. We are willing to work with the minister on anything that will be developed from the ground up into a system that will help our children meet our educational goals. The old way of including First Nations input as a footnote to the process hasn't been successful in the past and won't work moving into the future. And uh, that statement was issued April 16th of this year. So clearly still very dissatisfied with the consultation process. Well, what are some of the substantive concerns that have been identified to date, Mr. Speaker, um, by the regional uh, chief and by uh, uh, the individual chiefs and council from Treaty 6, 7, and 8? One of the critical concerns is about, around the transfer of governance. And a key demand of these First Nations and all First Nations has been to gain back control of their educational programs from the federal government. There are substantial concerns um, expressed by both the regional chief and by the grand chief and the individual chiefs, including uh, Chief Rose Lubicon, who is the Treaty 8 chief responsible for education. Substantial concern that the minister still retains substantial control. And if I can share some of their comments. Um, again, uh, Chief Rose Lubicon has stated, in quotes, we already have a process in the works in Alberta and it's been in place for some time. Uh, now that we have heard this announcement, we are wondering what this is going to mean for our children. It sounds promising, but we hope it is not yet another historic broken promise. Treaty 8, or Alberta, has been working on a grassroots education process for years already. And uh, Grand Chief, Chief Capo says on the matter of controlling their own system. One of the concerns, says uh, Chief, Grand Chief Capo, one of the concerns was to have First Nations control over First Nations education. They have definitely changed the name of the act, but the core of it remains the same as before. Ultimate authority to dissolve, change, or transfer any entity that handles First Nation education still resides with the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. And he goes on to say, well, an oversight board has been created. They simply advise the minister. He is still able to unilaterally do anything he wants in any given on-reserve school. So those are concerns by... Um, the First Nations themselves. I heard similar concerns from the regional chief regarding uh, the Joint Council for Education. And it is that there is absolutely no assurance of who will be appointed to this advisory body. Secondly, the power to appoint rests singularly with the Minister and Cabinet. And three, there is absolutely no requirement that there be any First Nation representatives sitting on the Council. A second concern, Mr. Speaker, goes to the issue of transfer of liability. And uh, the regional chief has expressed very strongly to me a deep concern that similar to the safe drinking water law that was recently enacted, Bill C-33 transfers liability to First Nations to deliver quality education programs and provide safe schools absent any guarantees of future funding support from the federal government who have that mandate and responsibility to be financing those quality schools. He added that while well, the bill mentions comparable programs, there's no specified criteria on how to determine that. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker, there's great concern expressed um, by Treaty 6, 7, and 8 on the delay in the funding increases. Uh, the substantially less funding support for First Nation education compared to provinces and territories has been long-standing and reprehensible. The government has promised increased funding but on what basis they raise is this figure calculated? Uh, does the increase adequately consider and factor in the rapid increase in Aboriginal population? The commitment in the preamble to lifelong learning where First Nation uh, uh, adults wish to go back to school and continue their education or address the potential for the return to First Nations of members to finish their education? What is the timeline for ensuring all First Nation children will have access to quality education in safe schools and accorded equal opportunity? The Alberta First Nations are raising reasonable concern. Why is the increase in funding delayed until 2016, they are stating, in other words, until after the next election? That additional annual funding is needed now. And if I could just close again uh, with a, a quote from uh, uh, Chief Capo. He's stating another outstanding concern is around statutory funding and funding to support Indigenous languages and cultures. 
However, the Act only states a portion of funding would already be, we're already receiving must go towards language and culture. It's not new support. We're getting the same amount of funding, still lower than our provincial counterparts, and all they've done is added a section to the Act that says we have to spend part of that in language and culture. They have just painted an old car with a new colour. Thank you. Questions and comments? Questions and commentary? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, as I'm listening this morning, I'm reminded that some of us are far more aware of others, I think, in this country of the havoc that the NDP's uh, policies continually uh, wreak when they get a chance to implement them. And once again this morning, uh, we hear them being completely out of reality. And I, I would argue, Mr. Speaker, that once again they're demonstrating they don't have the capacity to govern a bit responsibly. On Wednesday, their Aboriginal critic stated that they're going to be opposing this bill. Mr. Speaker, this is a bill that is aimed at lifting on-reserve high school graduation rates, which are less than half of those in the rest of Canada, Canada. And certainly any reasonable Canadian cannot possibly agree that the status quo is, is uh, acceptable or sustainable. I don't think we can, we can do that. Our government's brought forward a bill that would finally address this issue. Uh, it would give First Nations control over their, their education. And it, would, and it addresses the five conditions that the, uh, the chiefs laid out in their special assembly in Vancouver. Yet every step of the way, the NDP have chosen to, to oppose this bill. I just want to ask the opposition, uh, why do they continue to support the status quo? And how are they going to explain that to this next generation of uh, First Nations students who are, who are trying to get through school? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have no trouble whatsoever standing and uh, standing by the comments that I've shared with the House today. It's my first and foremost obligation to represent the perspectives of the First Nation peoples. I'm obligated to do that by the Constitution. I'm obligated to do that in keeping with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Rights of the Child. Perhaps the members on the other side don't feel that they actually, actually have to comply with international obligations that they sign on to. I have simply shared with the House today what the First Nation leaders in my jurisdiction are saying, that people, the members on the other side can either can respect that perspective or choose to ignore that perspective. I am simply conveying, I am being a voice uh, for them until the time that they can fill more of the seats in this place, which is my personal desire. Um, I feel I'm taking a very responsible position. The First Nations have an absolute right to be consulted in advance and accommodated in how this system of education is going to be delivered. This government has held out in its preamble. It's going to do that. Regrettably, it's looking like the substantive provisions are not delivering on the preamble. Questions and comments. Questions and comments are the Honourable Member for Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Thank you very much. And I, and I sincerely thank my friend from Edmonton for her comments. I think she based them both in her personal experience and the experience of this country when governments acted unilaterally, imposing their will upon First Nations people, and saying that they knew what was best for them. We, we know what that path led us to, to, to great harm that has lasted generations, and it's a, it's a shame upon this country that the Prime Minister did the right thing in offering the apology, but within weeks cancelled the Aboriginal Healing Foundation program, which was established to help people deal with the effects of residential schools. So one can understand why First Nations people in this country feel a certain amount of cynicism or dread when they uh, see the, the Conservative government come up with the First Nations Act and say, trust us, this one's good for you. We know best. Now, to her point about what's happening on the ground in terms of where the solutions lie, because they don't lie here in Ottawa, not with this minister and certainly not with this government. The solutions to the challenges faced by First Nations people in Canada rest with First Nations people in Canada. And those educators that are out there with minimal resources doing a remarkable job, and in some places a, a job that has been noted by many groups. So I'll ask my, my friend this question, that the C.D. Howe Institute, not, not generally known for progressive analysis, has noticed that, had noted that in their research on, on British Columbia, that the, the programs that had been established in coordination with the B.C. government, with First Nations people, had been producing results and were in the process of dramatically increasing those graduation rates and those success rates. The First Nations Education Steering Committee in B.C. just had the rug completely pulled out from under them by this government. All the funding gone, all the work gone, all the progress gone. Now, I asked my friend from Edmonton, from her experience and the First Nations people that she has spoken to, the chiefs, the educators, what the sentiment is like on the ground for those that have worked so hard to achieve results under difficult circumstances, 
when they now look at this act and the way that this act is being brought in by this government and the details in there, the unilateral control and power that rests with the minister who's made himself the minister of First Nations education, that the, the, the panel is established but without any true joint consultative process. I'm wondering what message she believes is being sent to First Nations people and to First Nations educator, educators across this country when they look at this act despite all the efforts and work that they've been doing on behalf of the entire country. The Honourable Member, member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'd the, like to thank the member from uh, Skeena Bulkley Valley. That's a very complicated question, and I'd love to have the opportunity to elaborate. But that is exactly what we're supposed to be doing in this place. It's regrettable that uh, the government has already cut down the opportunity for debate. Um, I am hoping that this government will actually deliver on the request by First Nations that this bill be taken out to the communities so they can actually give their direct feedback, particularly the members of those communities. I think it's what's really important, Mr. Speaker, is to keep in mind then when the government is holding out that they're going to be providing um, equivalent education opportunities for First Nations children and families, that we're not in the same straight uh, beginning place. You know, we're not starting in an equivalent place. Uh, we've got schools, as, as the chiefs uh, point out, uh, Chief Lubican points out, our children need better learning environments, quality lessons, classrooms and furnace rooms and basements are appalling and unacceptable for any children. Our teachers' salaries are below the Canadian average. There have been inequities going on for years. So while the government says it's going to give a, a greater supplement, I think 4.5% over time, that, that may well not be enough. And the question they're asking is, how is that calculated? Is that in considering the rising Aboriginal population, the high percentage of youth, and how much money it's going to take to rebuild and provide safe schools, equivalent teaching, and so forth. So it's a big task, but the First Nations should have a direct voice. Questions and comments. Questions et commentaires. Uh, the Honourable Member for Churchill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I do want to uh, build on what my colleague from Edmonton has said. I mean, the, you know, I have the uh, honour of representing a constituency where uh, 33 First Nations uh, all share major concerns when it comes to education funding. Uh, yesterday I had a chance to rise in this house and talk about a school that doesn't have a fire alarm system. There are schools that have 69 students in a classroom, schools that have mold in them, uh, schools that have uh, portables that in minus 40 weather uh, freeze and the students are, are cold. And the uh, member talked about uh, underpaid teachers, a lack of resources, there are, there's a lack of books a lack of papers, a lack of pens, you know, the, the most uh, uh, the clear indication that First Nations students, because they are First Nations, have unequal education in this country. And the question uh, I would ask to this member, if she could comment, is why is this government not acting uh, uh, and fixing these schools and, and, and dealing with these resources right away? Why didn't they do that last year? Why didn't they do that when they became government a number of years ago? Why these empty promises and, and, and worst of all, uh, this paternalistic approach that the minister knows best? Uh, why didn't they act earlier and why aren't they listening to First Nations in taking that action now? Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank uh, the Honourable Member for Churchill. She has been a long standing um, representative for the interests of First Nations since she's been elected, and I commend her for that. Indeed, as I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, we're starting a different place for First Nations and their education system. Uh, it's not simply a case of, oh, now we're going to give them supplemental funding so they can build up their library or they can buy equipment for their lab. They don't have labs, they don't have libraries. And in most cases, their, their schools are, are mold-ridden. I've been to those schools. It is a travesty. And so the question is, what is the real amount of funding that's necessary, and why are we waiting until 2016? This is a false promise. There's no guarantee that the government of today is going to be the government of tomorrow. Um, it's absolutely critical that that funding come forward now. We should not be reducing the deficit on the backs of Aboriginal here, children. Here.